Amen. 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 We thank you, Deacon Williams. We thank you, Gospel Choir. Let the church say amen. Amen. Beloved, today I would have you pray with me around the message. Our struggles don't always sink with our sins. I'd have you pray with me around this first message from Job. As you pray with me around the, the series, Job's Three Lessons for Faithful Living, for the entire series over these coming three Sundays, including today. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Almighty and gracious God, God of our mothers and fathers and our God, now send out your light and your truth. Let them lead us now so that the words which are spoken and the words which are heard may be the words of the truth of your gospel for the living of our days. In Jesus' name, we pray all this. And the church was heard to say, amen, amen, amen. amen. and amen. Beloved, this afternoon, I go to Welshire Presbyterian Church. I go there, uh, it's the general manager of the world missions for the Presbyterian Church USA is a friend. Uh, he's someone who went into his position in Louisville at the uh, headquarters of the Presbyterian Church USA as a layman. He has heard the call of God and is being ordained into the Christian ministry today. And I go to participate in that service on our behalf. And I am need worthy of someone who would go on our behalf during the same hours I'll be there at, at Welshire Presbyterian Church to go to our sister church, Park Hill Congregational United Church of Christ. It is the Rocky Mountain Conference United Church of Christ, Denver Metro Association. This is the uh, this is the body which holds the standing of all the ministers, including myself and Reverend Dunlap and so many others in the United Church of Christ in this Rocky Mountain region. That meeting is today. Their annual meeting is today. I can't be two places at once. How many of you know you can't be two places at once? Yeah, Amen. Right. <laughs> Amen. So if it is on your heart to go on our behalf, there are papers and different catalogs and different things to pick up for the United Church of Montbello. Please don't leave before you pick them up. As you sign in, pick up whatever papers we have. But please let me know if you can go to Park Hill Congregational Church. Um, I can give you the address. I can give you the di directions. But I'll be standing there shaking your hands as you leave. <laughs> Amen. Hoping that one of you will just shake my hand and pull me down and say, I'll go, Pastor. I'll go. Amen. <laughs> From 3 to 5 today, and a workshop precedes it beginning at 2 o'clock p.m. This morning, beloved, I would have you just uh, consider Job. Consider Job. Maurice, we've considered Job, haven't we? Amen. How, some may ask, can something that starts so beautifully come to such pain? suffering and utter misery like the life of Job. Writing for the New Yorker magazine, Joan Acasella says, this book of the Old Testament, Job, opens with words both majestic and once upon a time-ish. There once, did you hear, did, did, did you hear Brother Lyles, there once was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. We turn to Job, we turn to Job today and over these next two Sundays because we've all heard Job's story before. Even more, we turn to Job one week removed from the massive Susan G. Coleman cancer walk. 
one that draws together folks of many backgrounds and places and stations in life, each one with a story, and usually a story of suffering, some with a concluding measure of victory, but many like Silka's story, for instance, a, a concluding measure of victory, but, but many with that familiar refrain of loss and devastation and all this disease stole from them and from their families, and from their outlook for the future, from our outlook in the future. There was a time in our lives where Angel would march with me. We marched together in the Susan G. Coleman walk because it was held on Saturday and not Sunday. Amen. I don't know how they got to Sunday, but I... you see, we, 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 we know one way or another. If we live long enough, we'll, we'll all see suffering has names and faces. Suffering has addresses and places. It has zip codes and phone numbers. And sometimes we don't want suffering calling us up on the phone. Amen? If we live long enough, we'll not just see it, we'll experience it. And Madeline will experience it sometimes in not too pleasant ways. Already in my life, on more than a few occasions, I would tell you today, I have seen and felt suffering holding me hostage, rendering me helpless, but all the time making me far more prayerful and penitent. It always does that even when I have no answers for it or can't do anything to comfort it or go like Job's friends went to Job. At first, they were the best to Job when they were saying nothing and just being in the midst with Job. Amen. Right. It's when they started talking, Bernie. We'll get into that next week. See, there's a part, there's a part of me that joins in with the philosophers of the ages who conclude this, that, that in human experience, suffering is an intrinsic reality and it's universally rampant. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can see suffering in every country if you look at it. Mm -hmm. You can see suffering in every age and in every life. You can see suffering if, if folk are willing to open up their wounds. And yet... The questions of Job's friends that we'll tackle next Sunday are questions Jesus himself sought to address. It was the disciples seeking answers in John, the ninth chapter, verses one through seven. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples ask him this, Rabbi or teacher, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Sin. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. For night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, Jesus went on to say, I am the light of the world. And, and this is the place, y'all, where Jesus made that old nasty spitball in the mud. He spat down in the mud and, and he made that mud ball and, and he fashioned that mud ball in his hands and he 
placed the mud ball on the blind man's eyes and he said to the blind man, now I want you to go and wash off your eyes down in the pool of Siloam. I want you to go and wash it off your eyes and when you wash it off your eyes, come on back to me and see me because when you come back to me, you will see me. And sure enough, the man went down to the pool and he washed off that spit mud of Jesus and he could see. Now I ask you today, is that a suffering story or is that a healing story? Hallelujah. Sin was not the culprit for suffering in the story. See, sometimes we want to blame our sin for our suffering. Sometimes we'll do anything so we can have hold of an explanation for what's going on in our lives. We'll do anything so we can have a reason, just one reason, somebody to blame or somebody to sue, S-U-E, sue. Sometimes we'll do anything so we can have an understand. Why, Lord, why? Why me, Lord? Why'd you pick me for this this time, Lord? And sometimes when we're seeking that understanding, sometimes when we're seeking that answer, that explanation, we go barking up the wrong tree. When we turn back to Job today, we see it's not his sin that sowed his seeds of suffering either. What we see is that there was a cosmic battle of magnificent import going on. Amen. The battle sometimes we say is not yours, it's the Lord's. Well, this is this is this is the Lord's battle, isn't it? One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, where, are you, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Job's virtue was highly regarded by God. Please know that when you struggle to be a virtuous Christian, God appreciates it. <laughs> when you struggle against lies and evil and ugliness in, in powers and principalities and places where ugliness is going on and you don't give in to it, God sees and God loves it. Amen? Amen. Job's, uh, Job's, I'm sorry, Job's virtue was highly regarded and highly prized by God. Carolyn, you know, it was even nobly named by God. Sometimes we just need to name the fact that we're the ones trying to do the right thing in the midst of some hard times and some hard ways to go. For our friend Job paid the cost to be well remembered and even emulated by those of us who read his story in our age and in our time, Sister Nelly. See, when difficult times and situations soaked with suffering come our way, remember sometimes that easy answers and explanations aren't, aren't available, nor are they even preferable they're not the things we want to hold on to or, or think that they're the best things to have in our lives. Remember Jesus' lesson to the disciples when hard times come your way. Look what, for what God is trying to reveal in you yeah. in the midst of your hard times. Look for what yeah. God is trying to reveal in you. Secondly, look for what God is trying to change in you. Because sometimes the hard times come because 
There's something we've been hard-headed about. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Theologian, the Reverend Dr. Kirk Byron Jones put it this way. He said, a troubled spirit may be new wisdom trying to get your attention. Listen to your blues. Hallelujah. Listen to your blues. Now, I readily admit, beloved, it's hard. It's hard to listen to your blues at the same time your trouble are going through them. It's hard. But those times come. And what I'm asking you when those times come again in your life, maybe you're on a mountaintop in your life. Maybe things are going so well and so right, you don't worry about anything anymore. Amen. Maybe you reach the point where you don't have any problems anymore. If you're that person, stand in line with me at the end of service and show yourself because I don't think it's true. (laughs) We all got our garden of Gethsemane. We all got something we're going through. But I'm going to ask you (laughs) that when you're going through it, don't just suffer. And don't just complain like New York Jets fans sometimes do. (laughs) Don't just complain. Don't just suffer. Don't just seek answers. Listen. Listen to your blues. (laughs) For in your blues, God is trying to tell you something. I remember the preacher in the color purple. He was a minor character. Amen. He had a daughter and he had put her out the church because he said she sang all that sinful music. Had put her out. Stone put her out the church of Jesus Christ. How could he? That was his daughter and his beloved. And there's this marvelous scene on a Sunday morning where she comes with her crowd and her people and they take over the church service. <laughs> and old preacher's got to let his collar down. He's got to welcome her back because our God is a loving God. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Our God will do what God needs to do to get your attention. Whatever it is, <laughs> listen to your blues. I suspect that's what one of the great faith leaders in my early life did, as God prepared his place for him. Chicagoans watched as the popular cardinal, Joseph Louis Bernardine, worked through his diagnosis of terminal cancer. He, he told the media he had less than a year to live in the summer of 1996. But secretly, all he sought was to survive through Christmas that year. God called him home, beloved, before Thanksgiving. And at the end of his life, Cardinal Bernadine wrote a book called The Gift of Peace. And in the book, he describes how faith, somebody say faith. Faith. Somebody say my faith. Faith fortified his ability to deal with false accusations that had risen against him. Faith. Somebody say my faith. Faith. Faith fortified him on how it was, how it how it gave him courage to contend with a fatal disease. Faith. Faith fortified him and gave him the strength to face even death itself. Faith gave him a the strength and fortified him through his misfortunes that inspired him to a greater love and a greater empathy for others instead of making him bitter and withdrawn. You see, that's what I fear if a terminal disease diagnosis came my way. I I think maybe there might be a moment when I just might want to give up. How about you? You think you can handle it? Don't ask. Don't ask. 
I, I, I had a woman preacher in, in my study group in, in my Master of Divinity program, and she used to say, don't ask God for no troubles, preacher, because you might just get them. You might, don't ask. Don't ask. <laughs> You're going to get them anyway at some of it, so don't ask. Amen. I said, okay. <laughs> I'm going to take that as wisdom. Amen. But do you see how it caused him to love it? And it's that opening of love that, that God is trying to show us, even in the times when we suffer, even when we're going through stuff we didn't intend on us being the ones to have to go through. We wanted to be the ones to have the crock pot at home and make the stew for the person that was going through it. Amen. We didn't want to go through it ourselves. Amen. <laughs> we wanted to be the one that brings the cinnamon rolls that we baked in the oven. Amen. We didn't want to be the ones. God, this is unexpected. Why'd you choose me? But it opens up a, a new place to love. Yeah. A new place to love. And beloved, it's a loving word that I give you thirdly and finally today. The word that comes from Proverbs, the third chapter. Whenever you're going through suffering, whenever you're going through hard times, hold on to, to, to Proverbs 3. 11 and 12, it says this, it says, but don't, 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 dear friend, resent God's discipline. Don't sulk, that's sulk, S-U-L-K, don't sulk under his loving correction. It's the child God loves that God corrects and a father's delight is behind all this. Amen. Sometimes you got to, to try and see what God is trying to reveal in you. Sometimes you got to recognize it's not just for hurting is for healing. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's something that God is trying to do so you'll change something critical in your life. But God loves us too much to leave us to suffer these things by ourselves without God's influence. God is still loving you in spite of what you're going through, in spite of the ways even religious people let you down sometimes. Folk who say they have a faith, even when your family members let you down sometimes, God still loves you. God's still with you. God's letting you know that you can listen to your blues. You can trust that your blues, they won't last always. Oh, I know it feels like it sometimes. Woo! I remember when that right leg was three times the size I'd ever seen it in my life. That therapist showed up at the house and he's smiling, having a good day, walking around everywhere he wanted to go. <laughs> walking in the house and saying to me, the swelling won't last. <laughs> and I would say, what? <laughs> Did you see this? <laughs> Put your hand on it. Feel how warm it is. Your blues don't last always. Oh, hallelujah. Your blues don't last always. Woo! But you got to listen to them. Because God's trying to sow a seed of wisdom while he's giving you that tough love. How many of you know that you can't you can't influence nobody unless you tough love them sometimes. <laughs> 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 
it's good to be flowery and loving and I'm going to hug you. We're going to hug up and everything. like All of that is necessary. But sometimes tough love is needed too, isn't it? So today, stay with me with Job, would you? You see, because in this cosmic battle first, what Satan said to God was, but protect his flesh, you know, put, you, you, you can take all his possessions away, but his flesh can be protected. I'm going to protect his flesh, God told Satan. I'm going to protect that, you know. But how many of you know the, the story of Job? Even the flesh protection got taken away, didn't it? See, that's, that's where we're going next week. <laughs> But God stayed with him. And we're not going to rush to the end. Amen. But we're going to pray today. Let us pray. Holy God, we, we thank and praise you that you never leave us and you never forsake us. We thank and praise you today that you never forget us. We thank you today that when we celebrate with the psalmist, Number 23, when we say, Lord, you are our shepherd, we shall not want. But you make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside still waters. You restore our soul. It's true. It's true. Sometimes we have to learn to hold on. Sometimes we have to learn to wait. Sometimes we have to learn that. Trouble's not going to last always, even though I'm dead up in it right now. It's all around me right now. But you're preparing me for something I have not yet seen. You're with me. And you're with us. You're a good God. And we thank you. And we praise you today. We glorify your name. We magnify you today. We give you all the honor, all the praise, all the glory for all you've done, all you're doing, and all you're going to do. We thank you, God. We thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for the opportunity to pray all our prayers in his name for his sake. For it is in his name that we pray today. We all said amen. amen. How about we come to the table together, beloved? Today, I, I'm going to ask if uh, Elder Rose and Elder Teresa, Elder Marva, the three of you would join.